Right, good afternoon again, everyone. Welcome to our third annual Youth Vital Conversation hosted by the Victoria Foundation in partnership with Coast Capital Savings. So we had the first part of our conversation last week um, and we're continuing today uh, with an older group of youth focusing still on youth financial well-being. My name is Zahra Ahmed and I am the Grants and Youth Programs Associate here at the Victoria Foundation. And on behalf of everyone here, welcome. We're very excited to have you and looking forward to the conversation that we're having together. Before we begin the event, I would like to start with a land acknowledgement. I respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we are hosting this conversation today as the ancestral lands of the Lekwungen people of the Esquimalt and Songhees nations. As someone who's quite new to these lands, I'm very thankful for the opportunities, the peace, and the guidance that they've provided me with. So before we start the conversation, I invite you all to take a moment now to pause, reflect, to become fully present, and to think about why you are here today. I invite you all to approach this conversation in a mindful way with positive intentions. And I invite you all to allow the land to guide us toward positive actions and dialogue. I also invite you to reflect on the complex relationship between finances, the dominant financial systems here in Canada and Indigenous peoples. We cannot have a conversation about money and finances without acknowledging this complex history and the ways in which Indigenous ways of being have been disrupted through these systems. Thank you. So for those of you that are here and unfamiliar with Vital Conversations, I'd like to just provide a brief background. The Victoria Foundation hosts Vital Conversations every year, and this is to bring together different community members and discuss issues that are pertinent to the to well-being of everyone. And so for the past three years, we've also hosted Youth Vital Conversations in partnership with Coast Capital um, to really focus on issues that impact youth in the area. Every year, we have a vital sign survey that helps inform the topic of the conversation. In 2019, the Victoria Vital Signs Survey reported that 61% of youth under 30 indicated the cost of living, including post-secondary education and housing, was a major issue that was facing young people in Greater Victoria. So given, thought, given that, we thought it was really important to incorporate this and explore financial well-being among youth into the Youth Vital conversation. So today that's our focus and we are looking to engage youth around the ages of 20 to 27 that are in or entering the workforce who face challenges around re employment reskilling and also challenges around saving money and housing options. So I'd like to thank Coast Capital for sponsoring this event and just being really wonderful partners to work with. They have really deep roots in our community and are committed to helping um, residents around the region and they just make really outstanding partners to all of us here at the foundation. I'd also like to acknowledge our amazing youth advisory. Um, these, these members really were integral to our event. So I'd like to wholeheartedly thank Tanya, Charlie, Divyesh, Megan, Ala, Jamila, Mark, Kamel, and Shaylin. So they're all here involved in the events and they'll be supporting it in different ways and they'll also be contributing to the dialogue that we'll have. So just, just a few logistics that I'd like to share. Um, we, we have this conversation and we'll be going until 6 p.m. today. For the first hour and a half, we'll have an interactive panel presentation. So we do have specific questions that we've prepared for panelists, but we also have opportunities for you to engage throughout the presentation. One of the ways you can do this is through the chat function. Two of our advisory members, Ala and Mark, are going to be asking everyone questions. Um, and, and we invite you to answer those questions and provide any comments that you have. We also have a live Q&A where you can submit your questions to our panelists. Um, and we also have uh, an option for you to speak out loud. So there will be moments throughout the conversation where I offer this and you can raise your hand. And once you do that, uh, we can unmute you and you'll be able to share your question or your comment out loud. Just remember that your video will still be disabled when we do this. 
At around 5.45, we'll begin to wrap up the conversation. We have two of our youth advisory members, Shaylin and Tanya, who are acting as listeners today. So they'll be listening for key takeaways and next steps throughout the event, and they'll have an opportunity to report back to us. Finally, we'll have Tanya from Coast Capital speak, um, and then we'll wrap up our event at 6 p.m. Um, I'm also very proud to share with all of you that this has been a very youth informed process and we'd like to, the event to be and remain youth driven. So we encourage everyone to participate with us through the chat and the Q&A, but we will be doing our best to prioritize youth questions and comments for the interactive portions of this program. So financial well-being, that is the topic for today. It's a tricky one, it's a tough one um, to talk about and also to understand. But a good way of thinking about financial well-being is thinking about just the extent to which you can comfortably meet all of your financial commitments and needs while also having the resilience to continue doing this in the future. So it's not just about the money that you're making and your income. It's also about the control that you have over your finances. It's about being able to absorb a financial setback. So if you have a car and it breaks down, if you find yourself in the midst of a global pandemic, what do you do? It's also you know, about just being on track to meet your financial goals. And it's also about the financial freedom to make your own choices that support your well-being and your quality of life. So as we begin the conversation, our intention is to create a really open, welcoming and courageous environment for tackling a topic that's often so difficult and considered taboo. It's important to understand and acknowledge the different challenges and opportunities that every person has associated with their financial well-being and also recognize the different experiences and relationships that young people have with money for a variety of different reasons. And this could be access to family sports, education, it could be gender, race, or other personal community and societal factors. So as we delve into the conversation, I really encourage everyone to think about how different parts of your identity have shaped your financial well-being. And just as much as possible, be comfortable or lean into the discomfort of talking about money, about finances, housing, or any other financial challenges that you might face. So with that, I would like to briefly introduce our panelists. I'm very pleased to have with us four amazing individuals, three of, three of whom uh, joined us last week as well. So Agul Kalile, the Manager of Engagement at RentSmart, Alicia Glover, the Executive Director of Community Microlending, Gavin Donatelli, the Youth Employment Outreach Coordinator for WorkBC, and Jamila Franco, a serial entrepreneur and advocate for inclusion of diverse communities in finance and also one of the wonderful members of our youth advisory. So we're going to start this conversation talking about people's relationship with financial well-being. So delving right in, I'd like to ask all panelists to just briefly introduce yourself and describe your relationship with money. So we're going to start with Agul. Do you want to answer this question first, please? Sure, thank you, Zahora, and thank you for this wonderful introduction. Um, uh, so I work with RentSmart Education and Support Society. Our organization believes in the transformative power of education to help individuals and families to find and maintain their housing and increase successful tenancies because that would prevent housing instability and homelessness. We also strongly believe that a successful tenancies are the, back, are the backbone of community well-being. Um, an, an individual's journey to stable housing begins with the first successful tenancy because that's when you get the confidence and that's when you get your reference for your next tenancy. So our goal is to provide a tenancy education and important life skills to empower people to succeed in their tenancies. Um, as concerns uh, my relationship with financial with well-being, um, I always uh, considered financial well-being very important. Um, I grew up in a family where money was tight, and my parents, they always emphasized the importance of education and having a career, um, earning, your, earning a stable income. What I discovered on my transition to independence and when I became an adult, adult in that 
was not really, um, uh, that I didn't really learn from my parents because we didn't have those conversations is, is as you said, Zahura, having the income is not an end in itself and does not mean financial well-being. The things that I've learned on the way that really helped me initially were the importance of budgeting, the importance of prioritizing your wants and needs because you can't afford everything you want, especially uh, in the beginning of your journey. And the importance of uh, making sure that you pay your rent every month and that's the first thing that, that on your expense list in your budget that's the first item that you have to pay rent on time um, i learned a lot of the, a lot of these things along the way and then um, life brought me to canada and i had my first credit card and it took me a few months to adjusting to using a credit card because i would just um, like the concept of spending money that I haven't earned was new to me and I didn't track my expenses really well. So I would just, you know, buy a coffee here. There was a good, there's some good jeans on, a good deal on jeans there. And I'll just spend it then in the end of the month or like whenever I get a bank statement, I just didn't even want to look at it at some point. I was like, oh my God, this is so scary. I don't want to, like, I don't even want to want to see it. So it took me a while to learn that, that you know, if you have a credit card, you need to budget, you need to control your expenses. And I think that's very important. Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you, Gul. Yeah, sometimes it seems like, um, where's this free money coming from when you have a credit card? So really important to, to think about that. It's, it's not free money, <laughs> you have to pay it back. Um, Alicia, I'm going to turn to you now. Would you like to share your thoughts, please? Yes. Uh, uh, thank you. Hi, my name is Alicia Glover. I use the pronoun she, her. Uh, thank you to the Victoria Foundation, Coast Capital, and all the youth uh, involved in, in holding this event. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Um, so I am, I am joining today's conversation both as an individual and as someone who works in the nonprofit world. Uh, I am the Executive Director of Community Microlending. Uh, we're a local nonprofit that helps uh, people develop their financial well-being by starting or growing small businesses or taking training that helps their employment uh, options. And we do this by uh, offering micro loans, so small loans. Uh, between local lenders and local borrowers uh, and by running training workshops and uh, sorry training programs and workshops that teach the basics of money and how to create uh, your own business. Now talking about money did not come naturally to me. Uh, my family is working class and I grew up in a household where we just never talked about money. Uh, we lived in public housing and faced housing insecurity when I was 16 and most of what I knew about money was taught to me um, by my parents' behavior. So it was, it was not ever said out loud, but it was modeled to me just in, in the long hours that they worked and, uh, and, uh, and you know, just how they showed up in my life or, or couldn't. Um, you know, so my parents taught me that if you needed more money, <laughs> you worked more jobs, uh, which is you know, exactly what they did. And it was at you know, a very major expense to their own well-being. Um, but thanks to that sacrifice, you know, I was able to to do things like sports and travel and, and later education abroad, um, but never really understanding, you know, the sacrifice behind it um, beyond just their absence uh, and uh, and understanding how to, you know, support myself in, in pursuing those things and, and maintaining some level of financial well-being on a, on, on a longer term basis. Um, and so because I had never taken the time to look at my own relationship to money, because I, I was just emulating, practicing, doing what I had been taught uh, through, through their actions, um, you know, I took that pattern with me into all of these incredible opportunities. And so, you know, <laughs> I'd be in school full time and having multiple jobs or, you know, it's, it was just um, this never ending, en never ending feeling of never having enough. Um, uh, so it wasn't until, you know, I, I took this job with community microlending that I began to hear, you know, other people's stories about money uh, and where it was holding them back. Um, you know, beliefs they had about uh, the money that they had, the skills that they had and, and the money that they need and, and what it would do to solve their problems. And, and you know, oftentimes that, that story wasn't really grounded in, in their own values or, or the opportunities um, or the resources they actually had to work with. Um, you know, so I realized that, uh, uh, you know, in, in seeing this in other people, I started to, to realize uh, and notice those own patterns in, in my own, my own behavior. 
Uh, so that's how I'm joining the conversation today. Uh, and I'm really, I'm really looking forward to learning from the other panelists and, and most importantly, hearing from, from the youth who are joining us today. Uh, please do engage. Uh, this, is, this is the most valuable part, I think, of, of having a conversation like this in the community. So uh, I look forward to engaging with you in the Q&A in the chat and, and uh, for folks who um, feel like speaking up with, you know, through their microphone, uh, uh, hearing your engagement there. Thank you. Thanks, Alicia. Um, yeah, what you said about th there never being enough and it never feeling like enough, uh, I think, resonates with me and I think probably with a lot of others, too. So thank you for sharing. Uh, Gavin, I'm going to move on to you now. Please go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is Gavin Donatelli, and I'm the Youth Employment Outreach Coordinator for WorkBC in Victoria and Saanich. So it's my job to support youth between the ages of 16 and 30 to gain access to WorkBC services in Victoria. For those that don't know, WorkBC is the primary government funded employment service provider in BC. We exist to help people find meaningful and sustainable employment that meets their financial needs while also giving them purpose in their job. Cause it's one thing to get paid and be able to pay for things in life, but it's another thing to feel fulfilled at the end of your day and to enjoy the work that you're doing. Um, the best part of WorkBC is that it's free. Um, so that's awesome. And the main ways that I help youth is to support them accessing WorkBC services, to be an advocate for youth at WorkBC, to create WorkBC events and learning opportunities for youth, like our virtual youth job club hired that actually just ran earlier today. Um, and then also to connect youth with employment programs and youth service providers to meet their needs. Uh, we're lucky in Victoria that there are a lot of youth employment programs and youth service providers. So I highly encourage you to take advantage of the resources that are out there. In terms of my personal relationship with money, I didn't know much about money management until I was 25. I've been working since I was 15, but I never seem to have any left over. And, and that was something that really got to me, especially in university, when you got expensive school, I started piling up credit card debt. And I was like, wait a minute, I need to figure this out. So at 25, I had to do self education on budgeting, saving and investing. And fortunately, through that process, I was able to save enough money that by the time I turned 30, my partner and I got married and went on a 10 month budget honeymoon, but it was incredible. And then we moved from Winnipeg to Victoria and this city is awesome, but it's also quite expensive. And so I had to like hone my budgeting skills even more to survive here. Um, and so I really love sharing what I've learned about managing your finances with other people because I want to give them the support and save them some of the steps that I had to take to figure it out. And the key thing to remember in terms of my professional involvement is that WorkBC can help youth gain financial stability through employment. So thanks for having me here today. Thank you so much, Gavin. I think, yeah, there's there's a pivotal moment in people's lives where they realize, oh, darn, what am I doing? I need to figure this out with money. So thanks for sharing that pivotal moment in your life. Uh, Jamila, I'm going to ask you to go next. Please briefly introduce yourself and explain what your relationship to money is. Thank you so much, Samara, and thank you, everybody, for just speaking, for sharing so openly and for hosting this. Well, everybody, my name is Jamila, and my journey has been a bit different in that I'm actually, I was born and raised in the Dominican Republic, and I came to Canada because I was the recipient of a full international scholarship that covered my tuition. So it's a bit different because you don't even really qualify for student loan debt when you're like coming as an international student, but you have to cover all of that yourself. And so for me, I think like many immigrants, I came to Canada because I was so excited for offering my family a better lifestyle. Uh, I'd even thought about, you know, when I have kids, I want them to be in a safer place. And I want to be able to have more time to be with them compared to the lifestyle that my parents were having back home. But when I started doing co-ops and even after graduation, I just quickly realized like the lifestyle that most people having here is not the lifestyle that I dreamed of. And the reason being is because I feel people are really caught up in a um, cycle of work for money so you can pay your debt so then they get more in debt 
and it is so use, usual for people to just live in this uh, type of lifestyle. And so I knew that if I wanted to break from that, I had to do things differently from what other people were doing. So it was pretty interesting where I was, you know, I was doing, so if you want to get a permanent residency, one pathway is you have to work for a full year or more, but you can get enough hours, etc. So I was, you know, the usual and responsible, I'm going to call it the story where I was working full time during the day and I would go in the evenings to either take courses or get training so that I could get my business going on the side. And then when I got my business going, I started making an income through that side. I just realized like, if I want to have time back with my family and later on, then I need to change things. And so that just came into, I have to be responsible and heal my relationship with money to understand where am I spending? What's a priority? What's a need? I have right now, I'm very lucky to say I have a very good relationship with an advisor, a financial advisor that has helped me make better financial decisions. And I'm 25 years old, but the conversations I even have with my partner are very open about money. We talk about we're even looking at buying our first property now, which is like, I'm super young and that's a really great gift. But I've been able, by organizing myself, I've been able to even direct money towards investing and starting other businesses as well, which has been really helpful. And it's not the story of most people, like realistically, it, it can be very expensive to do those things, but you know, priorities. Instead of going shopping, I ended up saving money so I could reinvest it later and things like that. And so right now, in terms of my titles and positions, uh, that's where it gets long. But I like to say I solve problems for different businesses, uh, the ones that I'm involved with. And I work more on the financial side of things. So I help people save their money, reinvest, or when it comes to businesses, I help more on the strategy and the financial side. And uh, my business range from the area of biotech to financial services. Thank you. Thank you, Jamila. I, I really liked what you said about healing your relationship with money. That's a really, really nice way to look at it, you know, just kind of the damage it can do, but also how to heal that damage and, and learn from it. So thank you for sharing that. My, my next question for, for all the panelists is, why is it important to think about your financial well-being? Um, and Alicia, I'm going to ask you to answer that one first, please. Okay. Um, so, you know, when it comes down to it, you are already beginning to form your beliefs and patterns and behaviors, uh, your habits around money uh, and work. Uh, and these are going to affect your financial well-being uh, now uh, and until they are examined and changed. So, you know, uh, when, so when you don't actively think about this and take ownership over your financial well-being, you know, it leaves room for everybody else's fears, beliefs, agendas, patterns, and values to, to creep in and shape how it is you relate to money and to work and, and to how much is enough, um, you know, and, and it, you know, when, when we continue on in that unexamined way, uh, when other people's, you know, with other people's <laughs> behaviors or patterns, um, and when that doesn't line up with what, we, what actually makes us happy or what we need to, to be well, um, you know, it, things can be really difficult. And so the good news is uh, that you're at a great point in your life, um, at any point in your life, but especially now uh, as a younger person to start to create, you know, your own money story uh, for yourself and, and, you know, not your ultimate money story, but the one that works for you now, uh, you know, your next money story um, and start to test the ways of managing your money and, and discovering what works for you. You know, tools for managing money, you know, on their own will not uh, provide you with financial well-being. You know, I am myself guilty of creating many budgets and then forgetting them. <laughs> and it's because those certain tools and the ways I was using them weren't a match for me. And so the sooner you can start to, to think about your well-being and, and come up with a strategy that is in line with your strengths, uh, your not strengths <laughs> instead of weaknesses, um, and your goals, uh, the more effective those, those tools will be. Um, and the good news is, you know, there's, there are a ton of free resources out there to help you test out different strategies for using these tools. Uh, and so, you know, give yourself, you know, three months to, to try and uh, try a certain way of budgeting or a certain strategy to for investments or wherever it is that you're at in your in your financial well being uh, journey. Uh, and, and be honest with yourself, say, okay, what worked, what didn't, um, you know, what, what do I need next? 
Um, and the earlier you start doing that, the more empowered you'll be to make decisions about, you know, everything else that is tied to money, which includes, you know, the skills you want to learn, the industries you want to be working in, you know, the, the cre creative projects you want to be developing, you know, where you want to live, what kind of place you want to live in, you know, there's everything else will be a lot clearer and a lot more in your control uh, the sooner you, you get grounded in, in uh, having ownership over your, your financial well-being. Thanks. Thank you, Alicia. Yeah, it sounds like there's there's a lot you need to work on with yourself um, as you're thinking about financial well-being and aligning your goals to those tools that you're using. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Gavin, I'll, I'll ask you to share next, please. So I think it's important to think about your financial well-being when you're young, because there's no better time to get a head start on saving. As well, it's a really good time to try and avoid getting trapped into debt because that can be a lifelong battle as debt compounds over time. And if you start with a foundation of really solid skills and learning those, those will help you out. Like I wish I learned my budgeting skills maybe five, 10 years earlier. I think I would be in a, a lot better place. Um, as well, thinking about your financial well being can help you target jobs that pay enough to cover what you want and need, and also give you an idea of where you'd like to end up working and earning as you age. And think about the uh, time versus money equation, um, because yeah, you can work 60, 80 hours a week and earn a lot of money, but you might not have a very satisfying life. And so a really good question for financial well-being or what are my expenses? What do I need? Uh, what are some extras that I want and how am I going to be happy with the time off because oftentimes I find time off is just as valuable if not more valuable than financial remuneration. Um, by earning more though you have greater financial security without having to give up too much. I know most people hate the idea of budgeting. It seems boring and often to budget you have to decide what you're willing to give up or cut back on. But I like to flip it around and think of, okay, if I meet those targets, what do I get to spoil myself with? Like, where is my end game? And usually for me, like, I love to travel, not happening right now, but I try and like send a vacation out like a year away or six months away. And that's my goal that I work towards. And then I spoil myself for the savings that happens in between. Um, and once you come up with a plan and stick to it, you pick what you get to spoil yourself with. So an iPhone, a concert, a car, your own apartment, uh, saving for school, or investing for something huge like a home or retirement. And that, that's awesome, Jamila, that you're you know, getting close to entering the housing market here because that's a huge milestone. And you know, Victoria is quite an expensive market. So to be there at 25, props to you. Um, <laughs> I also think of, uh, you know, Warren Buffett, one of the like best investors out there, talks about how the biggest return that you can get from investing is investing in yourself first. And that either means in education or launching a business and being able to propel yourself forward so that you can achieve more of the things you want out of life. So I think that's something that really plays into the conversation about financial well-being. One of the big advantages that you have when you're younger is that you, A, have more time to accumulate wealth and let it grow, and B, you might have less financial responsibilities than somebody who's older, and that gives you a real advantage. Uh, you also can learn skills to stretch your money and make it grow further, because I hate paying retail. You're generally getting hustled if you're gonna pay a retail price, so if you can like, find ways to buy the deals and, and look for those opportunities or wrinkles uh, in you know, the purchases you make, you'll be able to save more for later. Thanks for sharing, Gavin. Yeah, thinking about kind of a way you can spoil yourself in the long run um, is, is a good and maybe helpful mindset for some people. Um, so before I ask Jamila to answer, I'm just gonna uh, remind all participants that you can type in your questions into the live Q&A and we can have panelists speak to those questions when we have a chance. All right, Jamila, please uh, go ahead and share your insight. 
Yeah, okay. So I'll be the one who like goes against what everybody says. And okay, the first thing is that I love when everybody says you need to find what works for you in terms of financial well-being. I think we need to take a step back and define first what is financial well-being. And we also need to disassociate ourselves from financial well-being just being linked to money because there's so many things that come as a result of you being and feeling financially secure. And to me, the biggest thing, I'll tell you a story. I was working right after graduation at UVic. And even though I was getting like the highest paycheck I could leave a dream of, and I was like, oh, I'm getting paid. I think it was $28 an hour. And I thought that was that, like the coolest thing ever. But I remember I had a car because I decided to buy a car and I couldn't afford to pay all the gas prices, the insurance and everything. And I was getting chargebacks like on my, on my checking accounts because I just didn't have enough money in my checking accounts. And I was just wondering what is going on? Why am I getting this like, even though I'm getting paid, why am I so nervous? Because I need that next paycheck to pay all of my bills. And so even with that paycheck, what I realized, you know, if I don't have an understanding of what lifestyle I want to have, then usually what ends up happening is that the moment I feel like my income is increasing, then I'm just going to be spending more and I'm not going to be saving more. I'm just going to continue finding excuses to be spending more and more. So my well-being now became, after, of course, going through a process, I realized, like, I really value eating healthier. So I'm going to set money aside so I can buy more fruits and vegetables. And we all know buying organic is expensive. Like, another example would be, I want to travel. So I'm going to intentionally put myself in situations where maybe I'm going to arrange, before COVID, for my friends to come over to my house instead of all of us going out and having dinner at places. So it really became linked to, you know, what do I want to enjoy in the future? And what does that success and financial well-being means to me? But realistically, I really have to work on my mindset because I didn't, and there's a thing, you know, they call it the investor's mindset where I had to understand that I was going to get a benefit in the long term. And I can tell you right now, most of my expenses were literally going towards video games. And I say it because I've been a gamer since I was young. If you go to the living room, there's like stacks of video games. My partner and I both play video games. And right now we're like, okay, we're just going to buy maybe one game a month, if that's the thing. And then we're going to save the rest so that we can, you know, reinvest it in something else. But that financial well-being, reinvesting, I want you to think about it, reinvesting in your health, in your housing situation, in your education, like it's not just linked to money, just like your worth, it's not just linked to your money. And the last thing I want to share, I think that when I came and moved here, I realized that people, not something bad, but there's a very much of an individualistic mindset where I am the one who needs to take care of this. I am the one who needs to learn and do this. But I want to encourage you, have you ever thought about asking somebody else for advice and for help? Because I can tell you that I have a, a, an independent financial advisor that helps me because I'm too attached and too emotional about my money. So if I tell this person what my dreams and goals are, they're the ones who actually keep me in mind and help me meet those goals. Whereas now I feel less pressure to do it for myself. Great, thanks Jamila. Yeah, so many things that intersect with money to think about as well. Um, and I think you've captured that really well, so thank you. Um, so we've, we've heard from all of our panelists and we also ask these questions in our chat. Um, and so we'd love to hear from two or three participants on, on their thoughts about their relationship to money and why it's important to think about financial well-being. So I'm actually going to ask a youth advisory member to come on video and speak to this to start us off. And if you'd like to share something about your experience, um, please raise your hand and we will unmute you so that you can share with your voice uh, still off video. But Ala, please go ahead. Hi everyone, uh, thank you for giving me the chance to share. Um, so my relationship with uh, money has actually changed over the years. I had to learn a few uh, things and unlearn a few habits that we, I had. So um, during university, I come to Canada almost like six years ago to study at university. Um, and at the beginning, like my parents would pay the money. Unfortunately, um, I didn't get a scholarship because I applied too late apparently. Um, so, but over the years, um, things and circumstances changed. So for example, we weren't able to um, continue paying for university. So 
I had to figure out ways to um, go out in the community and ask for help. And that's something that was really hard because everyone is sensitive about money in a way. And um, there is also that feeling that there's some shame to, you know, to be upfront and be honest about it and talk about how, you know, you are in need of help. And um, I was actually very fortunate to have um, people that helped me when I spoke out and they, even the university were able to help us out and uh, we ended up graduating. And also um, over the years, I wished a lot of things, or at least now, since um, you know, learning and studying and taking a course about um, finance, I wish a lot of things would be different. And actually, the main thing that I would do differently is that um, I would invest more. So, like, I had a lot of money saved up, but they're they're like sitting in my savings account. And I thought like two percent was a lot of um, you know percentage, and I thought my money was growing really great. But then after I graduated and after I learned more, I discovered that there's like even 10% or 15% um, and you can get your money doubling. You know, if you put like um, $10,000 at the beginning of university, you can have it doubled by um, the end of, by, you know, whenever you finish, whether it's five, four or five years, and that could help you whether pay your student loans or helps you, you know, pay for your first year of um, work after university or, you know, the month that you're, you're gonna spend searching for work. And so at the same time, um, something that um, I agree with some of the panelists is that, you know, finding other ways to earn income. So having not just one source because you never know what might happen. And so it's important that if you lose one job, you just, you know, you're not like stranded somewhere. And so coming from a low income family, I thought like, okay, maybe if I graduate and I, um, you know, start working, I would be able to help my family and we won't be, you know, labeled as low income anymore. But that wasn't the case because we just ended up in debt. And then um, it just kept on rolling over towards my um, siblings as well. So it's something that like, if only uh, we knew more at the beginning or if we, you know, we were, we had different ways or circumstances were different, um, maybe things would have, uh, maybe would have, made better decisions or at least would be more aware when making decisions um and yeah so my relationship with money improved over the years um and um yeah so there i am <laughs> thank you for letting me share thank you so much ella um i think yeah you, you're really pointed towards if if only i knew if only i knew so it's great that we're having this conversation together now to, to share that information um, and talk about the different aspects of financial well-being. So we do have another participant who would like to say a few words. Um, Ash, if you would like to speak, please go ahead. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, hi everyone, my name is Ash. Uh, actually, I wanted to share my own experience and and and, and point out um, a, a very important point to my opinion that and which is the um, to me uh, financial well-being is, is is sort of cultural. For example, in my culture, you have to have a roof over your head while you are old where you don't have to pay mortgage or rent because if you're old and you cannot you know work in different jobs or at least you have a roof over your head so this is in, in our head growing up so if you just want to have to save up i have to have a house or even a small if even super small we have to this is a mindset we all have it in my culture because we don't want to get to the point that we are old we don't have the stamina to work in two jobs or three jobs, and still we have to pay rent. Whereas when I moved to Canada, I didn't see that, you know, I didn't see like youth thinking about, you know, there, there are exceptions, but I didn't see, at least in my network, uh, even I could see people who are retired are still renting. It wasn't um, something and I'm used to it. So we started, you know, um, sort of saving or, you know, when we moved to Canada, that was in our head too. We have to get a place so that we can pay the mortgage back. 
by the time we are retired. I guess the culture aspect and some of the panelists or other participants actually point out this that they, they grow up, they learn it from, from their parents, uh, from their siblings and so on. But I guess this is so important to, um, and if not, we have to sort of, there are a lot of, um, you know, uh, places to learn, as your pal panelists mentioned. I have worked for WorkBC before, and, and this program has great, great, actually, um, programs and, you know, workshops to help you, whether find employment or, or budget. There are lots of them, and also I heard from other, your other panelists that they have this classes, how to rent, how to, you know, to be a great tenant, how to budget, I guess, um, it's good to have, a, you know, these kind of um, facilities and programs to help you grow. Uh, but to me, I grew up with that uh, mindset, even though when I moved to Canada in my adult time, I had that mindset, although I started from zero, as most of immigrants know, when you immigrate to a new country, you start from zero all over again, education, work experience, etc. I did it, but I was, I was, you know, successful to, you know, get a house with my husband and manage, you know, savings. Um, even when, when, you know, to the budgets, like culturally, you really love to invite people over. So I could, I would actually say by, by not going to a restaurant out to just you know, for that amount that I could spend for, for my husband and I, I could have like six people at home so that I can create my net for. Ash, I'm so sorry to interrupt, Ash. I think um, we just do need to move on. I want to thank sure, you so sure. much for Thank you for giving me experience. the opportunity. Of course, and also just for sharing that different cultural perspective too. Yeah. I think that's an important thing to think about. So thanks so much uh, for contributing thank you. to the conversation. Um, so, so this does bring us to the next part of our conversation, how youth are supporting their financial well-being at this time. So recently, Coast Capital conducted a survey in order to understand people's financial situation on the island and also lower mainland, um, just in light of COVID-19. And the results of this survey really just show how financially vulnerable people really are. So for example, the survey of 802 people found that most people are not financially prepared for unexpected crises, with 42% of them having used their savings to make ends meet. So this is pretty significant, and I imagine there's a lot of people who wouldn't even have savings to fall back on. And especially with younger people, just depending on circumstances, um, it can take a few years to accumulate a significant portion of savings, if, if that's even possible, um, given what's going on. So keeping this in mind, and also other challenges that young people face financially, my question for panelists is, what advice would you give youth at this time to help them think through their financial well-being? And for those, for those of you that are representing organizations, what services and information does your organization provide to support youth? Gavin, do you want to start that first? Sure. So unfortunately, COVID has hit youth hard with higher rates of unemployment. In June, youth unemployment was 29.1% in BC. And industries that typically employ large numbers of youth, such as hospitality and retail, were hit really hard during COVID and still continue to be. So my advice to you would be to try to get into the job market now. Uh, once the CERB and other government's financial support stop, there's going to be a huge number of job seekers looking for employment. And beating this rush of people trying to get employed can give you a large advantage because it's always easier to find a new job when you have a current job. Businesses are continuing to rehire and there are more employment opportunities opening up. In June, BC added 118,000 jobs. And on Friday, WorkBC put out six pages of job postings in Victoria. We put out job postings once a week. Um, and some occupations or jobs with the current brightest outlook are early childhood educators and assistants, social and community service workers, tradespeople, medical laboratory technicians, computer network technicians, and many more. Earning money now can help you avoid building up debt 
and it puts you in a better position to be promoted or potentially receive a raise as business prospects improve. And working during COVID demonstrates with resilience and will help you improve your skills of being adaptable and flexible, which are two of the most important qualities employers are looking for right now. Other qualities they're looking for is a willingness to pitch in because they're trying to operate businesses with less staff and they're looking for people that are comfortable shifting and dealing with new challenges because I'm sure we can all relate that the world seems to be constantly changing every day and businesses are having to adapt to that new environment. So where we can help is that WorkBC is here to offer supports to help you find employment. So that's helping you create or enhance your resume, discovering your transferable skills, teaching you job search skills to get at the hidden job market, which represents 80% of all jobs. Only one in five jobs is posted to the public and helping you become more comfortable interviewing over the phone or video chat, which is becoming much more of the norm now during COVID. The thing to remember is there's just much more competition now when you're job searching. Uh, before COVID, Victoria had the second lowest unemployment rate in the country. Now there's just way more people to compete with. And so our job is to make you that much more competitive to help you secure employment. We also stick with you for one year after you're employed in case you need to find a new job or you want to problem solve issues at your current job. And uh, we have workshops, courses that you can take online, and we also can provide various kinds of support to eligible clients for transportation, job starts, training, and more. This will help you save money as you're looking for work. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Gavin. I think you outlined some really important services that you're providing. Um, and just so every participant knows, we will be compiling this together so we can get that information to you. I'm going to move on to Jamila uh, with the same question. What, what advice would you provide to youth at this time to help them think through their financial well-being? Yeah, so something I will do, like, for example, if you have to get in debt, I would say understand what are some strategies where you can repay that debt faster or even having awareness of how that debt will pile up because I think it is so easy for us to get in debt, even for myself. Like I remember when I used to go shopping more, I will just be able to get a credit card at the till or like somewhere and, and you feel like, oh, later, it kind of feels fake because you don't see the money there. So, and also being very honest, budgeting has never been a thing for me. Uh, I have kind of like a general awareness of how much I spend, but I don't say I'm gonna stop here because there's things that are non-negotiable. It's like, if I'm gonna eat food, I really want it to be healthy because I want to take care of that because I know that if I'm gonna be productive, I need to be eating healthier. But you know, when I was in university, even after graduating, I didn't try to increase my standards of living like crazy either. Like if I move to a new place, I'd be patient and actually look for things on the side of the road or I would look at Facebook marketplaces, uh, things where I just wouldn't be spending that much money. In Victoria, there's so many resources that you can access. I remember I would even go to the food bank as well after graduating and or even when I was in university because I just didn't want to spend my parents' money. and. Think about it, just the conversion rates of like trying to pay things in Dominican pesos where one Canadian dollar is so much money back home. So I was very conscious of that and I think it was forced upon me because I just didn't want my weight to fall on my parents. So it was necessary for me to be responsible. In terms of resources and getting a job too, I think we need to think outside of the box and we need to start asking ourselves where can we bring value? And a challenge I find a lot of people face is that they want their dream job or they want to do this specific thing, but they're not willing to try something different. And I can tell you right now, if you make yourself valuable to other people, to businesses, to organizations, they will want to hire you. And there's actually resources out there. Like if somebody walked to me and said, hey, there's a grant that you can apply for with me because the government actually offers programs for businesses that want to hire. And I've been looking into those like, oh, you can hire a student, you can hire this, but I don't really even fully understand it. So if you were to actually go and even tell somebody, hey, you can hire me because I qualify for this and the government will cover half of your paycheck, of my paycheck, 
I will be very surprised if somebody didn't want to give it a try with you. So you have to make yourself valuable. We have to learn to give before we receive and bring in that value. I can guarantee that because that's what has worked for me all this time. So also understand your value, bring that value and that will be a game changer. Thank you, Jamila. Yeah, bring that value and know what is non-negotiable. Um, so before we move on to Agul, I'm going to share, uh, Charlene Smith shared with us in the chat that she has bi-weekly payments that go into an investment TFSA, and then at the end of the year, it's transferred into an RRSP. She was also able to consolidate her student debt from multiple sources to a single lower interest loan to pay it off sooner. But it did take her a long time to figure all of that stuff out. So I think, yeah, having maybe a trusted person to talk to, trusted financial advisor could really help you out with all of those terms that you might not understand, but can be really helpful. So thank you, Charlene, for sharing that. And Agul, I'm going to ask you next to share advice that you have and what your organization offers. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, Ransomart Education focuses on tenancy education and life skills to empower people to succeed in their tenancies. And um, it's a Victoria-based uh, nonprofit organization that was founded about 10 years ago. And um, initially how it was found is just a group of people got together and they tried to address an issue of um, um, home, chronic homelessness and housing instability for some groups of vulnerable populations like women fleeing violent relationships, youths exiting foster care, and um, other, other folks that were just constantly struggling with housing. And what they identified was a gap in knowledge and in education, because in fact, renting is not an innate skill. It's not something, uh, something you learn. It's um, something you're born with. It's not something that um, they teach at school. So a lot of people go into their first rental relationship quite unprepared and that is um that can go really wrong there's a lot of things in, that can go wrong in a tenancy if you're not prepared so the first thing we tell the people we work with is that you know tenancy is a complex contract and so going into a tenancy or going through a tenancy you need to be well prepared you need to know as much as you can because knowledge is power and you need to have the skills to navigate the tenancy relationship uh, which is particularly true uh, right now um, uh, in the times of covid i'm sure you all heard about the eviction ba ban so um, landlords are not allowed to evict tenants at the moment for non-payment of rent and um, Although it's a really great measure, it supports the tenants not to lose housing at the moment at this difficult time if they lose their job. It also uh, creates a situation where landlords, especially those landlords that you know have mortgages to pay and they cannot um, they they cannot get that rent payment from their tenants. They're getting disgruntled. So if there is um, in September, they're they're saying that the government is saying that in September they're going to evict the uh, sorry lift the eviction ban, uh, ban. so uh, there, uh, there might be, we're worried there might be evictions happening at that time unless the government comes up with a solution to support tenants to pay off their debts. And so if you'll be looking for housing, landlords will be even more uh, careful and even more scrutinizing tenant applications than it was already. And we all know that this is a very complicated and competitive rental market as it is already. So what we teach our tenants in the in our uh, courses is um, being prepared, being prepared when you're applying for housing, having a plan, having a budget, knowing what you can afford. There is like an affordability equation depending on your income, on your expenses, how much you can afford to pay for rent. And if you're paying well more than you can afford, then you know it's a bubble that's gonna break soon and you won't be able to pay your rent on time, which is the first thing we teach our tenants, pay your rent on time and in full. Like this is the first thing you need to know and that's what all landlords want from their tenants. Um, uh, um, other things that we teach are uh, taking care of your place because that's what the landlords want. They want their property taken care of and having a good relationship with your tenant, uh, with your uh, neighbors and with your landlord. So we teach our courses, teach um, a lot of 
life skills that are related to tenancy, like um, budgeting, communication skills, how to have difficult conversations with your landlord, um, how to avoid conflicts, or how to recognize a, a, like um, a, that a conflict is about to happen and how to, um, to mitigate it, um, how to uh, apply for housing, how to know your rights and responsibilities, uh, knowing what the legislation is, um, what, how it protects you and how it protects the landlord. Um, the other thing that we also emphasize in our courses is the importance of relationship. So we have this real, uh, really fun exercise when we, in doing, uh, that we do in one of our modules. We ask participants, have you ever ridden a unicycle? And usually just, you know, there would be maybe one person, maybe no one who say, who will say that they do, that they have. And when we ask why, because it's difficult, you can't balance on a unicycle, right? And that's how it is in a relationship. If you just have your rights, you know your rights, it's like being on a unicycle. And then we ask if anybody has ridden a bicycle. And so many people know how to ride a bicycle because it's a second wheel, there's more balance, and that's the same in a relationship when you know your rights, but you also know your responsibilities, which is great, right? You, you, you not only have rights, you also have responsibilities. And then we ask, have you ever ridden a tricycle? And then everybody say, yeah, it's super easy, there's so much balance, and that's, what, uh, and that's how we link it to relationship. So it's important to know your rights, to do your responsibilities, but also take care of your relationships with your landlords, with your employers, with your roommates and neighbors, and that's how you succeed. I think I've overspent my limit in talking. So I can, uh, if I have, uh, if, uh, if I can, I can talk in the next question about how, where we offer our courses. Yeah, perfect. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Thank you, Igual. I think I, I like what you said about knowledge is power and then sharing all of that really important knowledge with everyone, so thank you. Um, Alicia, I'm going to move on to you. Good sure thing. Um, I, yeah, just I, first of all, thank you to the panelists who've already offered their, their input. Uh, yeah, I, so I echo what's already been offered. Um, and uh, my, my response would be just to add to that context uh, and then two pieces of advice. So first of all, like, uh, you know, has already been mentioned, you know, for some people right now, uh, the relationship to money is one of survival. Um, you know, this is still a global pandemic. This is still a, a massive economic disruption. Uh, so if you just to normalize that, you know, if, if you or the people around you are in that survival mode and that fear mode or, or shut off, maybe, um, you know, that's, that is a reasonable response. Um, and I say that not to freak folks out, but just to to also contextualize you know, the, the first piece of advice, which is to get really, really curious, um, you know, in times of crisis and specifically this crisis, you know, uh, kind of the worst fears that you have about money are, are likely to come to the surface, um, you know, especially if your industry has been disrupted or your long-term plans are suddenly up in the air, um, you know, especially if you were looking at going to, to university in the fall, you know, there's a lot of open questions right now. So, you know, number one advice is to get curious, you know, especially when you have those, those strong feelings or reactions, you know, ask yourself, where is this coming from? You know, what's the story or belief behind it? You know, am I actually, is this actually a threat, you know, and, and help, you know, self-regulate yourself down to, to being able to respond to, to that, that, that response uh, and hopefully get out of uh, just reacting in how it is you're, you're uh, relating to your resources and, and your decisions around around your money um, you know and and when you as you're doing that if you know once you can get to the question of like is this helping me <laughs> is this helping me do what I need to do um, you know if the answer is no just thank the feeling and and regroup um, and and it may be helpful to have you know I, I know Jamila mentioned having the support of an advisor Maybe there's somebody else you know who you can ground with and check in with and just start to normalize this conversation with people you trust uh, so that you can be making um, supportive decisions for yourself, even if they're just the next decision, uh, depending where you're at uh, in this, this global context. And the second piece of advice is you know, to embrace uh, uncertainty and, and continuous learning, even if you are already employed. Um, you know, back in 2017, the Brookfield Institute uh, in their future proof report uh, you know, stated, quote, youth will need to be equipped with a broad suite of technical and soft skills, including skills associated with digital literacy, entrepreneurship, 
and social intelligence and and these skills are and that's because these skills are some of the hardest to replace with you know automation and robots uh, etc <laughs> um and so you know the the sooner you can embrace uh this the likely pace of change that has already been accelerated in the last four months uh the sooner you'll find your own way through it uh, and um, be able to be proactive in how you navigate you know the changing nature of work you know especially as a young person uh you know it's it's young people are um increasingly you know the entry-level job is being replaced by gig work uh and self-employment and so the sooner you can take control over the skills you're building to provide value in the workplace uh, the more control you'll have over over your financial well-being and so that that continuous learning piece, um, this is where, you know, I, I'm hesitant use, to use the word opportunity in the time of, a, of this situation. Um, so, you know, I'll say you look for the opportunities to, to add your skills, to develop your skill set, uh, you know, especially in industries you may not have thought of before, especially in those short courses, those, you know, micro skill programs. Um, that may build a skill set without a clear understanding of what career it's going to lead you to. Um, that it's uh, I know Alacrity Foundation, their digital uh, marketing boot camp. Uh, you know they've just partnered with the province to offer 500 free spots. Like there's there are examples of these programs out there that are are going to be more accessible than ever. Uh, and uh, you know the, the the more opportunities you put yourself in front of to to build those skills, uh, the better off you'll be. Um, and uh, that's that's something that you know you don't have to wait to go to university to to do um in terms of what we can offer as an organization to support uh, youth so we do work within a network um so we you know we're mostly interested that that our clients and the young people we work with connect with the program or the funding of best fit for where they're at and what their goals are we don't operate with any quotas or anything like that um, so we're happy to have a conversation, get a sense of what it is you're trying to do, and then either refer you to one of our programs or to one of the programs in our in our network, which includes um, provincial and national partners. Uh, so, you know, if you're interested in entrepreneurship or self-employment or social impact, you know, um, you know, no matter how big or small, uh, we're, we're happy to have a free one-on-one -on -one conversation with you. Uh, it's one of the best parts of my job is, is sitting down and talking to people about their goals and their vision for the future. Um, and even if you don't know how you're going to get there. Um, specifically, we also have a number of programs coming up in the fall. So we have, uh, we have a program for youth who self-identify as having challenges with mental health. Uh, it's the Enterprising Youth Plus program that will be happening uh, October, and, October and November of this fall. And so uh, information about that will be going out uh, after this session. Uh, we're also going to have a uh, another program for any people of any age who self-identify as having a disability uh, which walks folks through the social uh, lean canvas which is a great tool to help uh, clarify your next steps for a project or a business idea uh, or pivoting to to operating in in this context uh, which is online and and an ever-changing landscape um, and uh, we will soon be launching a, an ongoing series of, of one-off workshops uh, that's year-long and, and another chance for you to start to build your skills or reskill or revisit your skills uh, and connect with other people who are, um, you know, self-employed or, or building their own businesses uh, or social enterprises. So lots of opportunities to connect. Um, obviously, those are all in addition to the microloans, which, you know, youth are, are eligible for. And, and I'd be happy to sit down and, and talk about your options uh, there as well. But, yeah, that's that's <laughs> that that is what I have to say. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Um, I especially resonated with what you said about you know taking control over your skills and what you offer to the workplace in order to you know have that help you take control over your finances, given how quickly things are changing. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I think we have a hand raised. So I will ask Charlie to share their comments um, if they are still interested. Go ahead, Charlie. Sorry, it was just an accident. <laughs> oh, no, no worries, Charlie. Thank, thank you anyways. Okay, let's move on. Um, we have some, we have some questions in our live Q&A. So I'm going to ask I'm going to ask one of them and then maybe I'll ask one of the panelists to speak on that before we move into the next section. So 
Charlene Smith asks us, you know, says the gap between cost of living and compensation is so vast and saving and home ownership can seem so far out of reach for younger generations. So how can youth advocate for their financial future and get more involved in bringing awareness to the challenges that we face? Um, and so Gavin, you did share a few words on that. Would you like to speak on what you typed? Sure. Um, I think this is a really great question, Charlene. Uh, you know, it does seem like life is becoming more and more unaffordable and for youth in particular that are just starting out, uh, I really feel for you as a group. Um, I'm no longer in the youth category, but I still struggle a bit. So I can just imagine kind of the issues that youth are facing. I would say, and this is my personal opinion, not my professional opinion, that political advocacy is needed. Um, housing is becoming more and more unaffordable in Canada, and it doesn't seem like COVID has kind of addressed that issue with any of the political responses. I think it's great that there's a moratorium on evictions and that the province has provided some financial support to cover the cost of rent. Um, but I think we need more long term solutions. Um, and if you look at, you know, university costs or post secondary costs going up, when you're starting your life, it's just way more expensive now to launch. Um, so if you can reach out to your local members of government, I think youth banding together so they have a larger voice that's amplified as a way to continue to advocate to address financial uh, challenges that are facing youth. And, and I think there are ways to band together because, you know, uh, a political strategy is to divide and conquer but housing unaffordability happens across the spectrum uh, regardless of age. And it's something that we need to address with a national plan. And so I think the more we can encourage organizations such as the Victoria Foundation and all sorts of other you know, support organizations to advocate for some changes to housing affordability in particular, because I think that's the number one issue would, would be one way to start. Great, thank you so much, Gavin. Um, I think we are going to move on to the next portion of our conversation um, and just, just keep it going. And please keep the questions coming in through the chat and our panelists will try to answer them through typing and also live, just as Gavin did for us now. So as we, as we move into this next part, we are going to open up another poll for participants with, with questions for you to answer. So the questions are, who is your main support for your financial well-being? And how do you access, it, or how do you like to access information about finances? So again, just a reminder that you'll have to complete both of these questions in order to submit them. Um, and once you complete them, we can share, share the results. So while, while you do this, um, I'm going to share a couple of more results with you from Coast Capital's survey that came out a few weeks ago. So the survey indicated that 37% of island and lower mainland residents have seen their finances depleted over the past three months. 23% report that their debt levels are up and 38% of those working have had their employment compromised to some extent. So that really ties in with these poll questions, I think, you know, when problems like this arise, and even just in general, how do you access the financial information you need? And who is supporting you? Is, is there even anyone supporting you? Right, so we'll give you a few more seconds to answer those poll questions and then we can share. Oh, there we go. And we just have the results popped up for us. So who is your main support to your financial well-being? We see 33% of participants said a parent or another family member. 22% are saying friends or peer group. And also 22% are saying financial institution or advisor. For accessing information, 56% uh, like to access their financial information in person, while 44% like to go online and look at different websites for that. So, so that's like 
you know, two different, very different ways of accessing information, but very relevant and helpful ways of accessing it too. So thank you for sharing that with us. Um, does anyone in, in amongst our participants want to speak to those questions at all or share anything about their experience in accessing information and the help that they receive from people? I think we're going to start off with one of our youth advisory mem members, actually. Kamel, um, please go ahead when you're ready. Hi there, can you hear me? Yeah? Yes. Um, hi, so thank you for the wonderful event and thanks for all the panelists uh, again. <laughs> um, so basically, I, I, like I came in here about nine years ago and I was technically uh, yeah, a teenager, I was only 17, so I had no idea how anything Pretty much works and I went in, immediately to university and you know I would just be with school so I never actually thought about you know I have to start saving up and and do this and that and obviously now I regret it so much because it would have changed my life a lot uh, but now as I'm yeah getting into the I want to purchase a home I want to do this I want to do that basically I'm I started to do some research online or uh, join any kind of uh, workshop that shows up uh, joined the advisory committee as well. That's one of them, of course. That's how I can get more information. Uh, and also, like at my work recently, uh, they're gonna start uh, financial wellness programs uh, because they really like care about how employees are feeling and whatnot. And obviously, finance is pretty much number one stress reason for many people. <laughs> so they want to have people, you know, more relaxed and more focused. So that's one of the programs I'm gonna join. Uh, in terms of uh, support, the support I usually get just from my friends, um, uh, significant other, and uh, so on. That's mainly the main support I have. And uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Quick review. Great. Thank you, Kamel, so much for sharing um, where you're getting your support from and where you're getting your information from and a little bit about your journey to uh, really helpful for all of us to hear. So this this brings me to my last couple of questions actually for for panelists and Jamila, I'm going to start with you. Um, how have you been accessing financial information and how has this changed since more services um, has moved to online because of COVID? So in my case, a little bit different because me accessing financial information started right after I graduated because I got like, even though I studied biology, that's what I went to university for. I ended up taking additional courses to get licensed by the province of BC and work in the financial industry. So I started accessing financial literacy through those courses. And when you think about it as an investment, like whether I was going to end up in the financial industry or not. I am learning about something that is so important and that, you know, I'm working for it every day. Doesn't it make sense for me to understand how it works? So that was one way, but really when it came to what actually applied to me, it just came to working with an advisor. And I also, I don't work with an advisor from a bank. I used to have an advisor at my bank. What I realized is that if I go to just one financial institution, they're gonna support me from the perspective of that institution. And you know, when I first started wanting to save for a house because I want to buy my mom a house, it, I was like in third year university and they, I was like, I got money, I can put aside $75 a month and give me an account that's for long-term saving. And they just gave me one with less than a 1% rate of return. And when I think about it, I felt so comfortable, but it wasn't because they actually gave me what I needed. It, they just gave me what they, I mean, whatever fit their institutional model. So I actually work with an independent advisor who's also a broker, meaning he, that person can access different financial institutions, products and services. So that way I feel I have a more unbiased advice. And so with that, I make sure that I go to workshops. And even if I've seen a workshop one time, I keep going to the same workshop so many different times because I feel there's something different I pick up or even I teach workshops myself. And even by teaching, I feel like I am relearning and really like it's like a muscle. It's like going to the gym. So I treat it like that. But something that has really helped me in terms of accessing information because I need to make sure my basic cost of living are covered. And as a business owner, like the rest of my money, I don't even keep profit from my business yet. I still reinvest it or save it, etc. 
And so by connecting with people, and I got to pinpoint Alicia because Alicia has been a huge support for me. I remember I met her at an incubator program. And when she came in to speak about even the funding opportunities they had, I just felt so much better just knowing like, hey, I don't qualify for loans because I have no Canadian history, but I know that I can go to Alicia for that. And sometimes even though Alicia is so busy, I just call her and I'm like, Alicia, I want to do this, this and that. And she knows because I've done meetings with her like while driving my car and not driving. My partner is driving. I'm on the other seat and she has asked so she knows. But what I want to tell you is by connecting to these institutions, I believe that's how we actually bring the change because advocating is so cool. Like I advocate, you know, for people of color, for indigenous people, but there's so much my voice can do. I need to bring action. And these institutions, while they're small, you know, if you can form a bond with people, and that's what I've done, then I can actually tell, like I can call Alicia and be like, Alicia, I want to do this, but I don't know how, can you help me? And maybe Alicia has more time and she knows me. Or maybe now I know Gavin, I know what, what Gavin does. So my friends who are telling me I need a job, I can be like, yo, I know this person named Gavin. And Gavin and I spoke at a panel. So actually, you know, working through those relations, because it is an exchange as well, their work is there. And I find that us accessing as a way of activism as well. Like if you can speak to these people in this panel and say, this is what I need, this is what I've experienced, then they know that they can use this as well to shape their programs or to advocate for us. Because to be fair, I don't even have time to be a full-time advocate nor pace to be a full-time advocate. But my advocacy comes in the form of building wealth in the community. And how I do that? Well, I've been building businesses that are not fully successful yet. Like I'm still not profiting from them, but I know that with the process and with discipline, I'm gonna reach there. So that's like my way of telling you, like you have to reach out to these people here and you have to tell them because they are the ones who even access funding or can advocate to have programs that can support us. Thank you, Jamila. So yes, building relationships and getting comfortable in those relationships and asking questions and seeking support. Um, that's a lot of what I've heard from you. So thank you for sharing that and incorporating your own experience into that too. Uh, very, very helpful and insightful. So for, for Agul, Alicia and Gavin, I do have one for more question for the three of you. Um, and it's how does your organization share information? And how do you access youth? Also, how have you been changing your services to meet the need of youth at this time? And I'm going to ask Agul to share with us first, please. Thank you. Um, yeah, so as I said earlier, we offer courses, uh, um, tenancy education, and we used to do, to do that foremost in person and our courses are that much better in person they are meant to be interactive and they're meant to build on the skills and the community that exists in the group and people learn so much just from each other from each other's experiences from the activities that they do together we used to hold these free courses fairly regularly in our victoria office space that anyone was uh, you know free to register and attend we also work with a number of uh, youth serving organizations such as the Y, the START program, John Howard, John Howard Society, Threshold, ICA, et cetera, and where we come to them and uh, offer our courses as well or train their staff members to be able to offer uh, this, uh, this knowledge and this support to the, uh, to the youth that they work with. Uh, also through the support of uh, Coast Capital uh, funding, we offered this education in some high schools in Victoria, which was really great and very well perceived by some of the students. Because a lot of people uh, we work with, the feedback we get from them, they say like they wish they learned it in high school. Um, the other way we offered our course um, was through online. It's a self-paced online course that you can just go to, um, you contact me, it's um, www Rent Smart Online. Um, it's a long URL, so I won't say it here, but you can find it in the resources that will be shared afterwards. And we offer it free right now through, uh, we, we give a coupon code that anyone can take it for free. It takes about three hours to complete but it gives you all the information or most of the information you need to succeed in a tenancy and a lot of templates, like a template application form, a template recommendation letter and lots of uh, resources that you can use. 
um, ever since COVID hit, we uh, were working really hard trying to adapt our in-person course to an online situation because we can't be together anymore, unfortunately. So we, uh, it's still work in progress, but we do offer a program. And if any of the youth are interesting, uh, interested, they can reach out to me. We try to have um, uh, one course scheduled every one and a half months. And it's, it usually lasts over a couple of weeks and it combines a blend of self-paced online learning with a video call like this on Zoom with a facilitator that will answer questions, lead through some fun group activities uh, on Zoom. And then at the end, uh, folks get a certificate, which uh, they can show to a prospective landlord and say, look, I've uh, spent my time to, be, to learn how to be a good tenant. And um, some social housing providers such as BC Housing and CRD Housing, they recognize it as in place of one reference. So if you're lacking a reference, you can use the Rent Smart certificate in place of that. Um, so yes, we, um, we offer information. Um, on, uh, we, we have the online course. We have the virtual course that you can contact us to um, access. We also, uh, during our course, we direct people to other resources, like there's a wonderful website um, offered by TRAC, the Tenant Resources and Advo Advocacy Center. It's called tenants.bc and they literally answer in a very understandable way any questions regarding tenancy law. So if you have a tenancy issue and you, you want to know your rights, you just uh, go to tenants.bc and there's lots of information there. Uh, we offer also other resources like how to find, how to figure out ways to afford housing, maybe find roommates, uh, maybe reach out to some social housing providers, etc. So um, if if uh, if this is something that is concerning to you and uh, you're looking to start um, your rental journey, please reach out to our organization. We'll be happy to support you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agul. And again, you provided us with a lot of specific information and uh, places to reach out to and websites to look at. So again, I want to remind participants that we will be sharing this information, compiling it together and sending it out to you, um, just in case you don't remember everything that Agul just shared now. Um, Alicia, I'm going to move on to you now. Please go ahead. Unmutes. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, most of uh, since March 13th, we've been entirely online. So uh, all of the workshop offerings, we all the workshops we're running are all online. Uh, and any information we're sharing is on our website or on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. And any client meetings are happening over Zoom or by phone. Um, and, uh, you know, we can also talk to folks by text as well. Um, the main number for the organization is my cell phone, and so uh, it is a it's a textable number. Um, I would say, you know, friend of mine for us in terms of how we're adapting our services. I mean, our immediate concern at the start of this was uh, wanting to figure out how to essentially tighten the net of support for folks. You know, many of our clients, yes, they, we know them as self-employed people or entrepreneurs, uh, but they're people first. They have rent first. They have bills to pay, and uh, you know, we wanted to. Uh, use our network in a way uh, that would, you know, help them meet those basic, most uh, important needs first. Um, and so, uh, you know, once we, we saw that um, collective advocacy efforts were working and, and benefits were being changed, you know, they're not perfect still, but they're, you know, they're significantly more helpful than they were at the beginning. Um, you know, we shifted our attention to helping uh, existing businesses uh, to pivot to operating in, you know, within the health guidelines and, and within uh, this current market, uh, as well as starting to help folks who are pivoting to starting new businesses um, because they've either lost their jobs, uh, they have reduced hours and they need to, to add hours, or maybe, you know, due to health reasons uh, that, you know, their old job is no longer um, uh, a reasonable thing for them to do just to protect their own health. So uh, that's that's being reflected in, in our efforts in the fall where we're going to be, you know, returning and, and offering those entrepreneurship training programs. Um, all of those programs are going to be, you know, acknowledging the context of, of either starting or, or pivoting a business uh, during in this context. 
um, and including for youth uh, and be you know looking to connect folks with uh, you know, especially the COVID specific resources that are out there. Um, you know, I think Jamila's points about advocating, you know, off coming to a potential employer or a situation saying, you know, if you hire me, you'll get this grant. So, you know, um, bringing that awareness to advocate for yourself and to, to benefit yourself uh, is brilliant. And, and so, you know, our, our, our aim is to can build awareness of, of what potential support is out there and, and how folks can use it, um, how youth can use it to, uh, you know, meet their financial needs. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's essentially it. Um, you know, I, I, I won't say much more than that. Uh, we are looking for feedback on what is needed too. Um, you know, it's, I think what, March is only a few months ago. Uh, we're in this for a long time. So I, my request to everyone attending today or listening to the playback, like, whatever, whatever point you're tuning into this is, you know, please ask for what you need. Uh, and don't assume that you're the only one seeing the gap that you're seeing or experiencing the stress that you're experiencing or whatever it may be. Uh, and, and unless you reach out and, and tell folks, uh, uh, you know, often they won't know. So it really is a gift. Um, you're helping uh, people help you and everyone may not be equipped to help you, but if you keep asking, keep bringing that up, uh, you know, it could lead to sub sub substantial shifts. Um, so I, yeah, so please do reach out um, after this panel and, and uh, I'll make sure my contact information is included in the, the follow-up links and, and info that, that go out after this. Thank you, Alicia, and thank you for reminding us that, you know, a lot of these challenges that we're facing, we're not alone in them. And also thanks for reminding us that as service providers too, we are constantly learning uh, about what's needed and pivoting approaches. So thanks for sharing that. Gavin, I'm gonna move on to you now. Go ahead. So our organization shares information with the public through our social media pages on Twitter and Facebook. Unfortunately, we don't yet have Instagram, but I am advocating that we get it soon. Uh, we also connect with community partners such as schools, the Foundry, youth service providers such as Youth Empowerment Society, Boys and Girls Club, Threshold Housing, Pandora Youth Apartments, the Victoria Native Friendship Center, uh, the Victoria Immigrant and Refugee Center, and many more. Um, basically, because I'm the organization's dedicated youth employment outreach coordinator, I try to connect with as many youth as possible and their supports to help them access our services. Uh, we release a youth job blast once per month with hot employment tips, a list of the latest youth friendly employers who are hiring and upcoming work BC events that may interest youth clients. Uh, fortunately, right before COVID hit, it just so happened that my organization was launching its online learning platform. So the timing actually couldn't have been better and it's just a coincidence. So we now have all of our courses and resources available online through our Career Connect platform. And through our Client Connect platform, we offer our webinars online. So Career Connect offers a ton of courses on resumes, interviewing, job search, labor market reviews. So that's where they'll look at a particular section of the labor market, either an industry or a particular career path. And they'll give you an idea of like what the job prospects are. So are there more jobs or less jobs? What you can expect to earn? What kind of training you would need? And who the local businesses are that you could be hired by? Um, some examples are advanced technology, healthcare aid, there was one working on the water. Um, I know that's not an official industry, but we do have a lot of water related businesses here in Victoria. Um, and uh, so th there's just lots of content on there that you can do at your own pace. And then we have these interactive group webinars and I'm really excited now they're open to both self-serve and case managed clients. Uh, I can tell you more about that when we connect, but in a nutshell, it means that everyone that's accessing WorkBC can come on these group webinars. Um, my favorite is the Hired Youth Job Club because that's the one I run. It's youth led. So while we have ideas for different topics, we're really trying to figure out like what a youth want to learn in this and then set us to that task so we can have these engaging webinars that help you learn what you want to know. Uh, we also have music and we give away a gift card so we try and have some fun with the learning as well. 
We have our Pulling Together Indigenous Job Club, our Motivational Monday Job Club. There's a webinar on our wage subsidy program where if you're eligible, we could pay up to 50% of your wage for up to six months for you to build new skills with an employer. Uh, there's resumes and interviewing, and that's not all. These can be accessed through a laptop, a tablet, or even on a mobile phone. And we now offer our services through video chat on Jitsi or over the telephone. Jitsi is really similar to Zoom. I'm one of the few people in my organization that can text. So feel free to text me and I can support you that way. And if you're not tech savvy or you know somebody that isn't tech savvy or that's an issue, clients can book individual appointments to come into our office to sign up for services or if they really need that extra support for job searching, but make sure you ask staff because they do have to be booked in advance. So please don't hesitate to reach out. Thanks. Thank you, Gavin. Another good reminder about just how many services you folks offer and how many services RentSmart and Community Micro Lending offer. So for participants, reach out. Uh, these folks want to help you and they want your, they want kind of your advice too on what you need and they want to learn from you and they have a lot to offer so reach out. Um, so for the next little bit I want to look at some of the questions that we have coming in and just to remind all participants that if if they'd like to ask any questions please do that now through our live Q&A or please raise your hand if you want to share out loud as well. So one question that we have is, what advice do you have for young people in marginalized communities who are seeking workspaces that are fully accepting of who they are? And examples of marginalized communities could be Two-Spirit, LGBTQ+, Black, Indigenous, people of color, or youth with physical or mental disabilities. Um, so that's one question. Does anyone want to speak to that? Go ahead, Jamila. I can speak to that one. And I can tell you, like, when I used to work, uh, I, I had instances where I didn't feel comfortable myself. And that was also a big drive for me to wanting to go into business because I thought, like, oh, what if I can create spaces that bring up all the things that everybody in the community, because it wasn't just me, like, I wasn't crazy, are bringing up. And so if you're looking at staying on the employee route, I would say, well, can you reach out to businesses that have founders that fall under those categories? Because most likely they are intentionally working to create a space like that. I would also look at the mandate of organizations and actually not just say we stand for this, but to see what they're really doing. And one thing is like, if you tend to end up working for a company that's a B corporation, then they have and they must act on their socially responsibility, like environmentally, et cetera. And that would align more with your values. If you are looking to go more on the entrepreneurial side, I would say partner up with people that are already in the entrepreneurship field and that fall under your communities. And one good place to find people will be in accelerator programs or incubator programs. And you'll be surprised by how easy it is to reach out to founders. Like today I had a call with someone who went through an investor's round and she was like so casually about the fact that she fundraised $2 million through an investor round. And I was like, <laughs> how do I do that? So, uh, you know, once you get yourself in those spaces, I, I know that, and this is the other thing. Sometimes you literally have to just take it in. You just have to deal with it. If you can't find a place, you need money. Like you just have to. And then you need to prepare yourself mentally that you're only doing this temporarily and because you need to be in a better financial position so you can do something maybe for your family or for yourself. Because also what I realized, if you are from one of these communities, most likely you tend to be, you know, maybe your family depends on you. Like that's something that's in my case. So even in my job, I felt uncomfortable, but it wasn't like, oh, I'll just quit because I feel uncomfortable. It's like, yo, I really need something to be financially secure and this is not going to take me anywhere. So those are a few tips. It really goes to you reaching out because if you wait for people to find you, there's so much information that just gets lost out there. So you need to know what you want. Thank you, Jamila. Does anyone else uh, want to jump in on that question? Sure, I'll jump in. 
First, Jamila, I think that was an awesome answer and I totally support everything that you said. I can say that WorkBC <laughs> helps, uh, helps you do that targeted research on those employers because our job is to help you find sustainable employment. So while I totally relate that sometimes folks have to tough out a job, even if it's not a supportive environment, and that's really unfortunate, and we want to try to change business environments, while we're in that planning stage to try and find you work that's meaningful and is going to last the long term, that's a process that we're going to support you in researching those companies. Uh, we also try and network with different organizations that provide specialized support services. So TechWorks, or sorry, Ethos has a program called Community Works, and that is a supportive employment program for folks that identify, identify as LGBTQ2S plus and allies. And their mandate is, in addition to preparing people for employment, is examining issues that folks might experience in the workplace and also trying to encourage inclusive employers around there and, and change the culture in different businesses. We work with the Victoria Native Friendship Center. They have a youth empowerment and hospitality program. They would have a similar mandate of finding inclusive work for their graduates. Um, we also, one of our subcontractors is the March of Dimes, Island Deaf and Hard of Hearing and the Intercultural Association. And once again, we're able to provide specialized support services through them. You self-identify as you come into our services, and then those are additional resources that are available to you. Um, I've also helped clients that have just, because they felt comfortable with me, they've divulged you know, the way they identify and the workplace they're looking for. And then we just research. Um, there's a Facebook group called Jobs for Queers, and we just kind of reached out there and we're like, hey, what are some supportive workplaces? And, you know, there's a lot of movement right now um, to address issues facing folks who are BIPOC and identifying supportive, friendly businesses, both to support them economically and also have inclusive workplaces for people we're helping get employed. And so one thing that our company is going to take on more is getting better at identifying those inclusive workplaces as a service that we can offer clients because we do it now, but it's a little bit more ad hoc and I'd like it to be a focus thing that we do. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you, Gavin. It's nice to hear about some of the different initiatives just that WorkLink is taking um, to address these, these issues and try to make change. So thanks for sharing that. Um, so as we move into the last part of our conversation, um, what next? I'd like to still keep it open to participants to share their questions and their comments. So please keep asking us your questions through the live Q&A. Please keep asking us questions through the chat and raise your hand if you'd like to say anything. So one of the questions that we are going to ask you is what information and resources are you still looking for? Um, and that's for you participants. So it's your chance now to ask any questions you have remaining about information and resources and our panelists can can give you as much information as they can. Um, so please do that now and we'll try to move through as many questions and as many people as we can in the next uh, few minutes before we close close things up. And so one of the questions that did came in um, was around any active advocacy right now to raise awareness and solutions regarding affordable housing. And I see that, you know, Alicia and Igwil both typed something up. So maybe I'll ask both of you to speak on that while we wait for other questions that might come in too. Um, Alicia, do you wanna go first? As it relates to, to housing and advocacy, um, yes, I was, so I was just typing also in response to the last question and, and thank you, Jamila, um, that was, yeah, brilliant. Um, the piece I was gonna type and I'll say it out loud is first of all, ask before you're ready. Um, so reach out to, to business owners or employees who are in the field you're interested in and um, who may share an identity that um, is under invested in uh, or subject to uh, 
challenges. Um, so reach out to folks uh, early uh, before you're ready because they may have information or opportunities that you're not aware of yet. So um, as for housing and advocacy, uh, yeah, I, I would say also, I mean, you can tap into either look for campaigns that exist and, and um, I know that was recommended there's a few recommended in, in the response to that question, uh, but also, you know, begin to use it. Sometimes, you know, like I've mentioned before, like your problem may not only be your problem. And so, you know, just citizen led advocacy that's not affiliated with the group can also have a really strong impact. Um, as a former political staffer, uh, you know, we, we were at the computer um, as the initial screening for all those, those advocacy letters that come in before they go to the MLA or the MP. Um, and, uh, there is a particular power to individuals reaching out and sharing their story of impact and how a certain policy or law is affecting them, uh, including you know housing affordability. Uh, and often that has even more power than than what a you know a shiny, well-organized campaign can can do. So, um, you know, the goal really is to to rise above the noise, get somebody's attention, and then um, you know nudge them to to act so you you know um it, and one way too if you don't if you don't feel comfortable doing it by yourself is um looking into petitions so you could organize you know people to sign on to this petition calling for a certain action or certain named in the legislature or the parliament and it's a great way to to keep the awareness up and and um the issue grounded uh in in the community that uh, your elected reps uh, represent so i don't know if i was answering the right question i realized after now because i was doing two things at once but uh yes thanks oh you 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 were alicia thank you for for sharing that information and for bringing in your experience as a political staffer too and just kind of how that process works when you're trying to advocate uh, politically. So Agul, I'm going to ask you to share as well. You mentioned some an organization called Generation Squeeze. Um, could you speak to them a bit more and any other efforts that you might know of? Yeah, I, uh, I brought them up because we had a brief interaction with them through our work. And I, I, as, as I understand, they do a lot of good work with uh, advocacy for younger generations and um, uh, just to make sure that all generations have equal opportunities and um, overcome different struggles. And they have multiple campaigns going on. They also do active research for um, uh, about pertinent pro uh, problems right now and issues. So I think that's a good start. And I think in general, like using the resources available right now, what the internet offers, what the social media offers. Um, we have, we're living in a time where social media is such a powerful tool to have your voices heard, to unite with other uh, people that are facing the same challenges and just uh, combine your voices and make sure they are heard. So tapping into that, I think, uh, has a lot of potential as well. Thank you so much, Yugul. Um, so we are actually uh, reaching the close of our conversation. So first, I just want to say thank you, panelists and participants, for that very informative and engaging dialogue that, that just happened. So we have a lot to think about, and we do have a few minutes now to reflect on what we've heard this past hour and a half. Um, as I mentioned, Shailen and Tanya have been taking notes of key takeaways and next steps and they will each share what they've captured. So I am going to ask Tanya to share first. Please go ahead when you're ready, Tanya. Hello, um, I'm Tanya. I'm part of the Youth Advisory Committee. So um, a few of the things that stood out for me today were um, learning to budget and having a financial well-being strategy. Um, so whether it's long-term budgeting or short-term budgeting, so long-term meaning like retirement or saving up for a house or short-term budgeting, like your credit card bill or your rent. Um, I like how Alicia phrased it, create your own money story. And um, there's no better time to get ahead and start saving than now when you're young, which is something that Gavin mentioned as well. So when you get your paycheck, um, ask yourself questions like your expenses, your needs, and your goals, and then assess them. And then a few next steps that I 
heard today were um, when Jamila said, make yourself valuable and available and try and get into the job market now as there could be a surge of job seekers after the serve money runs out, which is something that Gavin mentioned. And you can, a few resources that you can use are um, to get into the job market are all the services that Gavin mentioned and WorkBC. Um, and then building relationships and networking with your community and people in your community, just like the organizations that we heard about today, like community micro lending, Rent Smart, and WorkBC. And finally, I'm going to emphasize it again assess your expenses, your needs, and your goals, and create your financial well being strategy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tanya. It was very well said, and I think you captured a lot of key points from the conversation. Um, Shaylin, please share your thoughts when you're ready. Thank you, Zahura, and thank you, Tanya, um, and to the panelists for sharing your thoughts today. Um, some key takeaways that I had, um, it was like one piece that Yamila said that really um, resonated with me. She said that financial well-being is like this muscle that you can keep continuing to work out. Um, like Alicia said, um, like just because you have a job right now doesn't mean you can be thinking about what your next step might be or different ways that you can continue to learn and grow um, as you continue on in life. Um, I really liked what Agul said, as, as Tanya said as well, that relationship building piece could be the step you're taking right now or it could be the next step that you're thinking about, especially now um, with a lot of things being online, people don't have to commute to meet you for coffee. They could just meet online, which is kind of fun. Um, knowing your value and investing in yourself um, is another step that you can take now or thinking about as you go into the future. Um, and then my last kind of takeaway and next step is to really take care of yourself. Like Alicia was saying, I mean, we are in a pandemic and as it is so important to be thinking about the future, it is also important to think about yourself in this present moment, recognizing if you are in a place of panic or um, uncertainty right now, that that is okay. And taking care of you right now is where you might need to be as well. So um, thank you. Thank you, Shaylin, and thank you for, for highlighting that last point about taking care of ourselves, whatever that might look like, very important. So thank you to yourself and thank you to Tanya for summarizing that for us and capturing some important points. Um, I'd like to ask everyone now to just pivot your attention. Um, we are going to open up a few more poll questions just to get some more feedback on the event. So there are four questions that have just popped up for you and I ask everyone to please complete it. Um, it's going to be up for just about a minute. So to review the four questions, they are, did you, what, did you get from this conversation what you came for? What were the best parts of this Youth Vital conversation? Do you feel you have the information and resources to support your financial well-being? And what steps would you like to take or will you take going forward to support your financial well-being? So you have about a minute to complete those questions. And as people are finishing up the poll, I'd just like to let you know that we are going to be working on a report and an infographic to really just capture what we've heard throughout the conversation today and we're going to share that out. So do keep your eyes open for that. We're going to share it via email. Um, and like we mentioned before, this webinar has been recorded. So we are going to share that recording on our website, the Victoria Foundation's website, as well as YouTube. So if you want to go back and experience the conversation again, you will be able to, to some extent. So, so I encourage you to do that and share with anyone else that might be interested. So we will close the poll now. Great, okay, thank you all so much for your feedback. It does really help us out in understanding how we can continue planning events like this. So very much appreciated. I'd now like to pass things over to Tanya, who's the Manager of Community Investment at Coast Capital Savings. And she'd just like to share a few words uh, as we close. Please go ahead, thank Tanya. You so much. Hi, Zahura, can you hear me okay? Yes. 
Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Zahra. I, I just really want to take a moment and say thank you to you and to Tracy and to Rob and the entire team at the Victoria Foundation for hosting this really important event. You know, we really started talking about this event a long time ago now, it seems. And, uh, and when COVID came, the Victoria Foundation really was still so committed to ensuring that we uh, passed along a lot of the information that happened today, and I think it was more important than ever. So thank you to your commitment to this. Um, I'd also really like to thank the Youth Advisory Committee for giving them so much of their time. I mean, you've but to the Youth Advisory Committee, you volunteered your time and your creativity to bringing together this conversation, and it was so appreciated. And, and finally, I'd really like to thank the panelists for guiding this conversation and for your honesty uh, in sharing your own journeys as well with financial well-being. And, and of course, to everybody who showed up today, uh, I think uh, I hope that what you go away with is, is some information that will help you on your own journey. When we first started talking about this as, as a conversation, um, it was my best hope that what we were going to be able to do was to pass on some resources that would help anybody who would attend. And I have to say that uh, the resources that have been shared uh, are well beyond what I had imagined. And for each one of the panelists, uh, I, I've learned something from you. And you realize just how connected each one of the panelists are. So if you have a question uh, and if they don't have the answer, I suspect that they will know somebody to point you to that will have the answer. So at Coast Capital, we are a B Corp and we are a credit union and we allocate 10% of our bottom line each year to programs and initiatives that empower youth. So we are doing the work on a daily basis um, that, that many of the panelists are doing as well. And, uh, and so I really want to also say how much I appreciate the work that they are doing for youth every day. Um, you know, I, I learned three stats uh, recently that, that were pre-COVID stats and they're Canadian stats and uh, that everyday Canadians are now carrying $30,000 of unsecured debt on average. 53% uh, are living paycheck to paycheck and 49% are reporting spending more that they, than they earn on a regular basis. And when I hear things like that, I, I don't say those stats to sort of scare anybody, but I say those stats because what that uh, communicates to me is, um, is holding back potential. Um, I'm lucky enough to work with so many youth organizations that some of them um, are helping youth who, who need a roof over their head, but others are helping youth who are coming up with uh, the ideas of the future. And when I hear those ideas, I get so excited and I think we need to um, help these youth on their journey to financial independence so that the, so that the financial uh, issues are not holding them back from creating the future that we want to see next, uh, in the future, uh, the ideas, bringing those ideas to life. And, and so I hope that conversations like today are going to lower some of those barriers and, and, allow, and allow those ideas to come, come forward. So thank you again to the Victoria Foundation for making space for this conversation and for everybody who's shown up today. Thank you so much, Tanya, for those words. What a great way to, to close this conversation and bring it to an end. Um, so as, as we do that, I'd like to just take a moment again to thank our wonderful panelists, Agul, Alicia, Gavin, and Jamila. Thank you for your insight and taking time to share everything so, so openly. And for participants, just remember again that these folks, um, Agul, Alicia, and Gavin, they work for some really great community-based organizations that have so much support to offer um, and they want you to reach out. So they wanna help you out. So do reach out if you want more information or just if you want to follow up, we are gonna provide their contact information so you can do that. And thanks again to Coast Capital Thank you to our amazing Youth Advisory and thank you so much to you all participants for joining us today. I think that together we've created such an important dialogue around money and financial well-being and I personally am very grateful to have been a part of it. So I think that we should just keep this conversation going. Let's continue removing that stigma and let's keep talking about these challenges and opportunities. So thank you all again and have a wonderful evening. Take care.